This is Wretched Radio with Todd Friel. Lots of lessons from a history, specifically in Dunort. This is Wretched Radio. One of the subjects that has intrigued me for many years is what happened up north. <laughs> and I say that now as a an official southerner. Once you've been here for a decade, can I be considered a southerner, y'all? Sure. 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 What, why are there so many Baptists down here and so many mainline Protestants above the Mason-Dixon line? In particular, what happened in the northeast regions of America? That's where the great revivals took place. That's where the Puritans landed. That's the, the home of Jonathan Edwards. What happened? Nate Pickowitz wrote a book that helps to address and answer that very question, and it is very helpful. There's another book being reviewed at Themelius is the name of the website. The book is called The Making of Battle Royal, The Rise of Liberalism in Northern Baptist Life. Let's learn some lessons from the professor of historical theology at Central Baptist Theological Seminary, Jeff Straub, who wrote this book. He takes a look at the rise of liberalism in Northern Baptist life from 1870 to 1920, so a 50 year span. How did things go kafritz, <laughs> basically? <laughs> How could it be the hotbed of revival? And now it's, well, the Northeast, where it is a barren country with. There are some good churches there. Make no mistake about it. There are some very fine churches there. But I think a lot of those pastors will tell you, um, it's hard here. This is tough sledding that we are undertaking in this region. Mike Abendroth will tell you he loves his church. He's been there now for a very long time. He's not going anywhere. But he talks about how difficult it is to minister outside of Boston. Boston? What happened to Boston? Well, that is what this book seeks to try to figure out. And I think that there are some lessons for us today. Over and over again, we see that the first doctrine the liberal leaders re-envisioned was that of... Can you figure it out? Which doctrine do liberals tend to go after first and hardest? Because it's the linchpin. It's the key to everything else. Tony, you want to offer a guess? Joey, you want to guess which? uh, Exactly. Bibliology. Go after the Bible. You undermine Scripture and everything else falls. In the mind of this mold, the text is sacred but not inerrant. So it is a word from God but not the word of God. Hear the difference? Christians back then were encouraged to doubt the Bible, but not to doubt those who doubt the Bible. And it became the the cool way to view things. Where did all of this start? According to this book, the seminaries, typical seminaries, when they start going wonky, they're always ahead of the folks. But then it trickles down eventually, and that's why we have a time span of 50 years to see why, what happened in the Northeast, what happened in Northern Baptists. Minnesota, I get. It was infiltrated mostly by Scandahoovians. So what do you see? A ton of Lutherans. You know, you've, you've got a bunch of Roman Catholics to boot in Minnesota. Baptists, few and far between. That I get. Wisconsin, I get that. But the Northeast, what happened? Bibliology was the first doctrinal domino to fall, but many fell after it. Propitiatory atonement, that's a problem. An exclusive call to Christ on the mission field, in other words, missions got all squishy, and a commitment to expository preaching, just little homilies, little life lessons. The church, check this out, became a social change agent committed to a gently Marxist vision of economic uplift in the Russian Bushian form. He was a liberal, is what he was, Walter Rauschenbusch. He was a very liberal man. We're going to hear about him more. But he was was a social justice guy. Soul salvation out. Social betterment in. 
the church's mission, not saving souls, but saving culture. And so the church's mission mirrored progressive politics until the two basically merged. Isn't that what we see today in so many of the mainline Protestant denominations, the liberal ones at least? And I think we're seeing that very same threat in the South today. There is a very big push for, quote, social justice. And many people are squawking. They're saying, hey, we, we've seen this play before. This has happened before. These are political ideas. These are secular ideas. Of course we address this subject. Of course we do. Where else but the church? Now, has there been social inequities that have been manifested inside of the church? Yes, by individuals. There have been. And probably continue to to this day. That's a sin issue that needs to be repented of. What is the solution for that awful thinking? Salvation. People get saved. It's funny how these issues kind of get cleared up for folks once they get saved, don't they? They start to love the things they used to hate, hate the things they used to love. They potentially used to hate somebody of a different skin color. Now they hate racism and they love those people in Christ. We see from the 1870s to 1920s a shifting away from dealing with issues that are social problems Not with a theological response, but with more of a social science response. A, quote, gently Marxist vision of economic uplift. Conservatives, here's a lesson for us, only woke up to the true threat of liberal theology when it was too late. The Baptists of the North had not lashed themselves to confessions. So the liberals chip, chip, chipping away, going after bibliology. Nobody spoke up. Nobody said very much. Nobody offered any counter arguments. Nobody said, we're going to hold fast here. Here's our confessions. Here's our statements. And the liberals just wormed their ways in and, and took over the seminaries, took over the Christian institutions, took over the churches and denominations. Is there anything we can learn today? I think so. Again, from this review from Thamalius, Conservatives are often better at building individual ministries led by a singularly gifted figure, while liberals are often better at laying the institutional groundwork for whole-scale takeover that proves impossible to dislodge. By the time the Bible-loving Northern Baptists woke to the threat of their eclipse, too late, they were in checkmate, nothing they could do by that time. Can we learn that lesson? I hope so. Now, Let's get to Mr. Rauschenbusch, Walter, to be specific. A. H. Strong. I wonder if he was Mr. Concordance, Mr. Stronger, Strongest, Strongest, Strongs. At any rate, Hmm. he held a reformed doctrine, but he hired Walter Rauschenbusch, giving him a platform. So at at a seminary, I believe it was a seminary run by Mr. Strong, he, even though he was kind of reformed, so more conservative, he hired a screaming liberal. I wonder why. I wonder if it was to placate the liberals, to play nice. It didn't turn out so good. That type of leadership is pure compromise. It's not leadership at all. It's taking a stand. This is where we're at on the issue. We're going to defend it biblically, and we are going to hire the appropriate people. This type the conservative who wants to be friends of all parties is perhaps the most bewildering type of leader found in the fundamentalist modernist controversies of the 1920s. It seems like they were the appeasers. Let's not part. Let's not. Let's just all get along here on these things. Some of these issues you just can't. Some you can't. Some you can. Some you can't. Back to the review. The great need of our own age is men who will lead churches and seminaries and colleges with personal warmth, amen, doctrinal conviction, amen, and confessional fidelity. God has called men to be the theological leaders of the home, church, and the teaching institutes of his body. That is the need of the hour. Indeed it is. Leadership isn't letting everything just go without stating a firm position and then defending it and altering it as needed. 
we, we, we need to learn from this lesson from a hundred years ago. We've seen this play before, haven't we? The verdict on liberal Baptist theology is in. It bankrupted schools, closed countless churches, and shuttered many missions outposts. This is not an opinion. It is a fact. Sound doctrine brings life. Unsound doctrine steals it away, and we see that happening in the 19th and early 20th centuries. May we not see it today. There's all kinds of challenges right now. Baptist evangelicals. We want to work through it. We want to make sure that we understand everybody's position. But once we do, there comes a time to say, here are the lines and we're going to draw them. And we are not going to let our seminaries, our institutions, our churches, and our denominations go because we're just trying to be nice. This is Wretched Radio. 